You're at 109 right now. Hey, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, it is a Saturday night, and it's a Saturday night, and I ain't got nobody. So, wasn't that a Sam Cooke song? <clears throat> That's not a, that's not a precise song. That's not accurate in my situation, but I am alone at the moment. Anywho, this is the IC109 podcast and I have an IC I have a 109 story to tell you. <clears throat> a quite quite a spooky one at that. Let's see. Um I had uh I wrote a note. Let me grab my my notebook. want to make this interesting and clear it might be a long one all right um let me get into it now first off okay here we go 10-9 all right the story of 10-9 um took a wild turn for me in 2019 when i lived in the country of oman that country is in the middle east it is an Ibadi, it's called Ibadi Islam, right? It's an Ibadi Islam, Islamic country. And I lived there. I worked there um, for about seven months. And um, some very interesting things happened, strange things happened um, related to 10-9, okay? Um, I have to say that before I moved to Oman, I had experienced these isolated incidents whereby those numbers um, would stand out for me. They would, um, for whatever reason, they would, you know, capture my attention and and I would um, I would document those moments like, wow, that's an interesting moment. So, for instance, three days before my birthday, uh, I traveled to Japan from Korea um, and, uh, the ferry that I, the ferry boat that I traveled on between Japan and Korea, it was, uh, ferry number 109. I saw my ticket and I said, oh, look, those are those numbers, 109. And 109 already, you know, held some significance because I was like, that's an allusion to my birthday, 109. So I'm like, oh, look at that, 109. I'm on the ferry boat, 109. My birthday is in three days. My birthday is October 9th, 10 9, 109, right? So I'm like, oh, that's cool. After I got off the ferry, I had to take a train to the the city that I, where I lived at the time. And uh, I purchased a ticket. And I was randomly assigned to a seat in row 10. So when I got on the train and I looked for my seat, I saw the rows. I saw row 10 and then to the right, I saw row 9. So I was looking at 10, 9 all over again, like, hmm, look. And it was it was a coincidence because it was like, wait, I just got off the I just got off the ferry, the ferry boat. And it was um, 10, 9 on the ferry. And now look on the train it's 10 9 that was three days before my um birthday oh yeah and then one other thing that happened is i was in um i was in okay back to japan the same weekend right this was the same weekend the year was 2015 this was the weekend before my birthday i was there to celebrate my birthday it was an early birthday weekend celebration for me so mind you those those two incidents those two isolated incidents that i just mentioned happened on that same weekend, plus this also that I'm going to tell you now happened. Um, I went to a ramen restaurant and I walked in and ordered um, the food. And the usher. Excuse me, I'm texting. I'm sending a text message as I'm retelling this story. So the usher says, all right you know, place your order on the, um, on the vending machine. Cause in Japan they have these vending machines. You, you punch the, the buttons or whatever. They spit out the tickets for your order. And then you are ushered to a seat and then you slide your tickets for your order under the, uh, the curtain. 
and then they slide your food under. So it's very private. Everything is very private, right? Anyhow, I got my tickets, and then the usher says, like, come with me, I'll, and I'll lead you to an available seat. Now, the restaurant wasn't full, but the guy led me to seat number 10, which I thought was peculiar because there I am seeing the number 10 again, right? But not only did I see the number 10, but also, you know, because the Japanese write in ascending order from right to left, which is different from English. We write from left to right. Well, from ascending order, from ascending order from right to left, that means that nine was written to the right of the number 10. So when I looked up from number from the booth that I was sit, that I was seated in, he assigned me to that seat. He put me there. He said, here, this is your seat, seat 10. When I looked up, I saw the number 10 and then I saw to the right. I saw nine. So there I was again. These three things happened to me on the weekend. That was three days before my birthday. I was in Japan. All three of these things happened and they called my attention to the numbers 10 and nine. Well, before I even knew anything about 10 and 9 or well before I had any interpretation or before I had you know even uh, an inkling of what the heck was happening to me I had no idea I was just like man I keep running into these numbers okay I had to tell you that because now check out this story all right so as I mentioned I, I lived in Oman I lived and worked in Oman in 2019 and <clears throat> Up until the time that I lived in Oman, all of those little isolated incidents had occurred whereby my attention was drawn to the numbers 10 and 9 or 10, 9, right? But this time I'm in Oman. Well, wait a minute. Okay. I was in Oman and I had like an idea to write a book about all of these isolated incidents before I got to Oman. But I didn't have a theme. I had no way of connecting all these instances. I had no way of interpreting all of this stuff. I didn't understand what was happening to me or why. And I was just like, ah, I don't know. I really don't know. So, anywho, I get to Oman. Well, wait a minute. I still have one more detail to tell you. Before I got to Oman, I worked in Saudi Arabia. And when I was in Saudi Arabia... Um, I went to sleep one night or I think I was sleeping. It was a, a nap, a nap during the day. I went to sleep and then I woke up when I had this like vision. I had this image pop in my head. It was the cover of my book. It was the cover of my of the first book that I would write about 10, 9. It was a red cover with white letters and it said one, zero and nine on the cover. Now, that, that came to me in a dream, all right? Now, that whole that whole image of 109 like that, okay, that's nothing. I can't say that that's, ooh, that, that's unique, whatever. It's like, no. Um, when I was in South Korea teaching, I had read a book that said uh, red is uh, the color of... Um, that is predominantly um, red is the color of uh, uh, red is a winning color in the Olympics. More often than not, the uh, champion, the winners are wearing the color red. So basically, the team that wears red during a match um, tends to have a psychological advance over the other teams whether those teams be in the NBA, whether they be in the Olympics, whether they be in whatever sport event, the team wearing red has the advantage solely because of the color. Or rather, statistically, the teams that wore red have statistically won more games than teams who wore other colors, period. So that being a statistic, being a, you know, uh, yeah, a, a fact based upon, you know, math that played, I think that played a role in, in that, uh, that vision I had in Saudi Arabia where I woke up and I was like, my cover needs to be red. That was my subconscious. You know, I had learned something and then my subconscious was playing into it. Like 
the cover needs to be red, you know, and then the letters need to be white, of course, and then there you have my, there you have the color. So it's there's nothing like unique about the cover of my book because think about all the things that are red from the Coca-Cola bottles to uh, the fire departments to stop signs, you know, anything that, that wants to really grab your attention, you know, and say, hey, this is really important. It's tip. It, t- it tends to be in red, you know, because that's the color that, you know, of passion and what have you. So anyway, um, I had that vision come to me a red cover with the white letters when I was in Saudi Arabia. But even when I was in Saudi Arabia, I didn't know what I was going to write the book about. Okay, cut to cut back to Oman. And for everything that happened in Oman, I it was like a watershed moment when I understood, oh, this all of this makes sense to me. Now I understand why I've, I've been seeing 109 and now I understand what story I need to tell. I, I, I understand the theme and I can put everything together and now I have it. So that's what happened to me in Oman. Oman was quite significant because I was able to, to understand things. I was able to learn. I, was, I asked some questions like, why do you think that happened? And I went, you know, I went to Google and I found an answer, but then... Um, that answer led me to some other answers that were that were just equally Google didn't satisfy me, but I went I, I after Google I searched other places for more answers and then I found some um some answers that were more satisfying. So it was like, wow, this is really dope, okay? So um all right, let me give you an example. There's um this company there was this company in 2019. There was this company called 109 World. And so I had I had a relationship with these numbers already. And these numbers were so important to me that when I saw some when I saw another brand, another company with my numbers on it, then I don't know. I got envious. I was jealous. I was like, what the hell's going on, man? No, I don't think I was envious or jealous. I think I was more curious. Absolutely, I was curious because what I did was I contacted someone on their staff and I said, can you tell me why you named your company 109 World? And they emailed me back and they were like, yeah, sure. And she ran it down for me. She told me that 109 World was chosen as the name of the company because... It's a reference to, or it's a, it's an allusion to uh, Hindu mala beads, because the mala bead necklace has a 109 beads on it, and she said the 109th bead um, is the guru bead, and the guru is like the guru sheds enlightenment and teaches, and the, it's a connector. It brings all these elements together, and I was like, that's the perfect metaphor for for what I'm doing like that completely relates to what I've been talking about like I've got all these isolated incidents and I'm trying to bring them all together excuse me that was a an email I just got and I'm like yeah that makes sense so I have to be the guru I've got to connect all these isolated incidents and then make some sense out of all of this stuff so I was like yo I'm with that I'm so happy that you were able to share that with me. And, and prior to me asking them, I had no idea about those beads, about this necklace. Today, I do own a, a mala bead necklace. I, ha- I own two mala bead necklaces. But at that time, in 2019, or even before 2019, I had no clue what the mala bead necklace was about or how many numbers were on any given mala bead necklace. Or, you know, I was like, I don't know, bro couldn't tell you (laughs) but I started learning these things and all of the things that I learned just helped me understand more about what was happening all right I've been I've been belaboring you know the task the task for me to to do what I'm supposed to do is tell you about Oman I'm really supposed to tell you about Oman but I had to tell you all that other stuff just to tell you you know get you back to Oman so I'm in Oman, 
All right, and I'm not going to tell you the details about what happens. I've I've said it before on other um, you know, podcasts or what have you, but but it's 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 really what you know, what happened tonight that I want to tell you about. So all the stuff that happened to me in 2019 in Oman, it allowed me to create my book. So I wrote my book and Oman was it and it was a very peculiar. It was a very it was a watershed moment that happened in Oman and it was just it's just Oman was so important, is so important to my story. This country called Oman that you probably have never heard of is so important to my story, period. That's it, right? Okay. I had to make some emphasis about that statement. Oman was so important to my story because here's what I want to tell you about, right? All right, so before I went to Saudi Arabia... Yeah, I have to go back in time. Before I even went to Saudi Arabia, um, for the first time I went, yeah, the first time I went to the Middle East was in 2016. I had never been to the Middle East. Yeah, of course. Of course I had never been to the first, to the Middle East. It was my first time. What am I saying here? Um, My dad had a book in his library. And because I was going to go to the Middle East for the first time, um, I went to his library and I grabbed this one particular book. This book is entitled The Genius of the Arab Civilization. It's a book that was probably written in the 1980s or 70s. Uh, I could reach for the book. I mean, I, I guess I'm being a little bit lazy because it's across the room right now. But I could literally stand up, walk, grab the book, and I could tell you you know, specifically, yeah, I think I better do that. I should just stop being lazy and just tell you exactly, give you all the details. So if you want to check, if you want to fact check me, you can do that. So let me walk over here. Give me a second. Okay, I got the book. I picked it up. All right. So my dad had this book. It's called The Genius of Arab Civilization, Source of Renaissance. It's the second edition. This is written by J.R. Hayes, or at least it says J.R. Hayes is the editor. This is a book published by... The MIT Press, that's right, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. All right, it was printed in Great Britain. All right, it says that it was uh, $10. So my dad probably purchased it for $10. I don't think my mom purchased it. He might have gotten it as a gift from uh, Benel. Benel is more into the Eastern uh, philosophy than my dad. He's Benel is the one who's uh, introduced my dad to a lot of Eastern philosophy, Middle Eastern philosophy, and other things. So I don't know. This might have been a gift for him. Anywho, okay, I found it. It says the second edition was printed in 1983. We got our answer, 1983. And it's in pretty good condition pages are I would say that the pages and binding are pretty taut basically my dad never opened the book <laughs> all right which is why I grabbed it off his shelf like yo let me see this I'm about to go to Saudi Arabia dad I need to see that book so anywho I grabbed that book and I, I looked through it thumbed through it and what have you um and uh and so my fascination with the um, the Arab world began in 2016. Okay. <sighs> Beautiful things happened in Saudi Arabia. I, got, I had so much more money than I had ever had in my life. And I traveled to so many countries. And I, but I, okay, that book was important. Now I haven't read the book. I haven't read it. You know, I read parts of it. I thumbed through it. I saw the pictures and things like that. But um, the uh, uh, the majority of what I know about 
Muslim countries, I, I think up until this point or up until that point had to do with um, YouTube. I was learning everything on YouTube, watching videos and what have you. One of the particular videos I watched on YouTube was um, about the Moors in uh, when I think it's called when the Moors ruled Spain. Um, I think it's like a BBC uh, documentary. There's a woman um, host and uh, historian. Bethany, I think is her name. Uh, it's old, but it's it's beautiful. It's it's well done. It's masterful. I watched that that video on YouTube a number of times, and I was just I was constantly um, inspired. I was impressed. I loved what I watched and what I learned about the um, Islamic world, um, especially the Islamic influence in, in Spain. So much so that I wanted to travel to see those places. I wanted to go to Granada, uh, Cordoba, um, and, well, those are the two places that I basically went to. I did go to Ronda and to Malaga, and then I skipped down to Morocco from, um, from Spain as well. But I... Um, I was really interested in going to Granada and Cordoba. Okay. So anyhow, I watched the, the YouTube videos to learn about that. Now, lots of details. So I got to Saudi Arabia. I had the book and I, I looked through it fine. <clears throat> Now, as I'm talking now, I have the I'm in my apartment and I have my dad's book in my library now because I was like, well, dad, what you doing with this book? You know, I, I need it, you know, so I put the book in my library. <clears throat> so. All right, I guess I just have to just come out and tell you. All right. So the book that. Okay, so what I discovered tonight, of all nights, just right now, tonight, the reason why I'm, I'm recording this, the reason why I'm talking to you right now is because I, I picked up that book tonight. And I noticed something in that book tonight that I didn't notice any time before tonight. Okay? I told you when I was in Oman that... I understood everything about 109, that the number, that the, the isolated incidents, I, I had a theme, I, I was able to draw it together. I, I wrote 109, the first copy of my book, 109, I wrote it in Oman, I printed the copies, I, I sent the copy to, I sent the manuscript to Sri Lanka, to a printer in Sri Lanka, and then they mailed me back two copies of my first, of my book, the first two copies, right? Um... All of that took place. So Oman is a very important uh, piece of the puzzle to the story of 109, right? Okay. So here's what I want to tell you. So tonight, I grabbed the book. I'm thumbing through the book, looking at different pages and, and pictures. Um, and one thing... This is aside from really what I want to tell you. I'm, I'm going to tell you something else. But what I started to see, I got this. I was, I was, uh, I was brought back to the revelation. About, brought, brought, I was brought back to the uh, realization that you know, Islamic culture is very integral to the world that we live in today. But we don't get a sense of how Islamic culture has influenced our world. What I mean by that, let me give you some examples. At the school, at the high school where I work, there's nobody really talking about Islam or talking about the influence of Islam, Islamic culture. Well, there is one teacher um, who was... Has, who has been um, showing the students and uh, teaching them how to uh, write uh, Arabic, write in Arabic. It's a Spanish class, and the teacher's showing them how to write in Arabic, uh, at least write the alphabet. 
kudos to that teacher. That teacher is is a phenomenal teacher, you know, doing stretching their minds and showing them, hey, this is these these things are connected, you know. She's dope. She's really really dope for for doing that, but also just in general, she's a really dope. She's really dope. Really dope person. Um So yeah, so I picked up the book and I was like, I was working on another assignment last week where I wasn't in the classrooms and then, um, okay, I was working on a test. I was uh, testing students um, and one of the, the, the test questions asked or the test question was about um, musical instruments and they mentioned this instrument, the lute, L-U-T-E. Now, although I was testing the students, like, I wasn't judging their response about this instrument. It was an English test, so they just had to talk about, you know, they had to talk about this instrument. Now, I had never heard of this instrument, and I was like, I don't know what that is. I don't know how well I would do on this test if I was, if I was asked to talk about this instrument that I've never heard of. So tonight when I opened the book and I found that instrument in that book, because it is a Middle Eastern instrument, I said to myself, wow, you know, if I had known that that was a, that, that the question on the test was asking about a Middle Eastern uh, instrument, then I would understand that that, that question is asking about another culture. I mean, I mean, I mean to say like that, that test was really testing, you know, the, that person's uh, knowledge of cultures, because if they, if they were, if they were keyed in, if they were keen on Islamic culture, they might have heard of that instrument, the lute. So there was a cultural element to the, the test that I wasn't privy to because I didn't know anything about that instrument. There's a cultural element to it. Like there were other there were other guitars and they actually they actually said that that the guitar was like musica latina. There was something they they said latina and I thought, "Oh, wow." Like for the students who are taking the test, they are Latin. These are Latin Hispanics. And they they these are Latin um students who um, you know, who are being tested on their English ability. So when I heard the, the word Latina in the presentation, I thought, oh, wow, this test is sort of, uh, it's sort of um, geared toward them. It's culturally sensitive. I think that's what I want to say. But then, just like the Spanish teacher who was sh showing them the connection between sp the Spanish culture and the Islamic culture or the Spanish language and the Islamic language, you know, I mean, there are no connections really to that I know of between uh, the Spanish and English. No, 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 Spanish and, um, and Arabic language per se. Certainly, if you if you say guitarra in Spanish and you say what? How do you say uh, how do you say guitar in Arabic? It's also guitarra or guitarra, something like that. Like there are those similarities. Acete for um, oil and sete, something like that for um, in Arabic. You know, there's there's so many words that are very close, very similar between Spanish and, and Arabic, but they're not they're not spelled the same. The alphabet is, isn't the same. Nothing, no, it's all different, right? But anyhow, where was I? But then, yeah, had I read this book, I might have known about the lute, and I would have seen that the the connection that they're that they're making about the guitar. Matter of fact, I'm so ignorant, I don't even know. Like I didn't take the test, so I don't even I didn't even listen to the presentation about the guitar. The guitar was probably saying the guitar was created in in an Arabic country and then later influenced to the Spanish and then the Spanish and then now 
Do you have an electric guitar? I don't know. I don't know what the presentation was about. I need to learn about the guitar, the history of the guitar, so I, I, I'll know my stuff. All right. But if I had read that book, if I, I would have seen that instrument and I would have made some connections, but whatever, but whatever. I'm, I'm trying to talk about Oman. The, the point was that book underscored the importance of the Arab civilization, hence the name. And that exam also underscored the importance of the Islamic civilization, the Arab civilization. But I didn't even know that because I didn't, I couldn't connect the loot instrument to the Arab civilization. So I was just like, all right, first there was the loot, then there was the wooden guitar, and then there was the electric guitar. Okay, that's the evolution. I don't know. I can't speak, you know, much more to that. I can just look at the pictures and show you, tell you the names, and that's it. But that's the role of education. You have to, you got to get down and dirty and get into this stuff. Everything isn't what meets the eye. It's There's more to it. So much more. All right, so, okay. So that book was important because I saw the loot in there. Now. For the pièce de résistance, the one reason why I made this 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 podcast, I'm even making this, is because I told you 109 gained some crazy significance and importance when um when I lived in in when I lived in Oman. And then tonight, I opened up that book, and there was a page about trade routes trade routes, Middle Eastern trade routes, Arab trade routes, and they were listing the names of the countries, the names of the cities where trade, you know, important trade points were. And I looked at that list and and I was like, oh, look, they have uh, Malaga, Malaga, Spain. I've been there. And I said, oh, look, then they have Cordoba. I've been to Cordoba. Oh, look, they have Granada. Granada is there. And then they had they had Turkey, but they had the different name. They had Constantinople, right? Like, okay, there we go. Another country I've been to. And so there are cities as well as country names on this list. And it just it the list just kept going on and going on. So why did I make this podcast? Why am I talking about this? Why, why, why? Because they listed 111 points, trade, points of trade, points of commerce, basically between Europe, Africa, and Western Asia, or as some people call it, the Middle East, right? They, they listed 111 points in this particular book. And do you know what the 109th? location was it was Oman yeah so now I'm feeling I have to talk about how I feel about this I feel like it's just so bizarre that for one I've lived in Oman for two, I had some very strange experiences, peculiar experiences that led to me writing my book entitled 109. Then the fact that 109 was produced, the, the name of my book is 109, and the fact that I produced the book in, in Oman that's significant, you know, to me. That That's already significant. But then for me to look at the book that I permanently borrowed from my dad's shelf about Arab civilization and to find that listed um, under... 109th the 109th place listed on the 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 trade routes 
is Oman, like it doesn't get any more uncanny, coincidental, synchronistic than that. Like for me, Larry Wiggs, 109 and Oman, that's the perfect marriage. Those two, because of everything that happened to me when I was in Oman. But to see a list, to see some random, I, that was an email, but to see some random list, just to see some random list, you know, I don't know, co-locate the number 109 and Oman together like that in a book that was written in 1983. All right, let me see what happened in 83. I can only think like 83 was an important year for Jean-Michel Basquiat and the painting. Wait a minute. Yo, that book was created in 1983. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make some connections here. This painting the painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat entitled uh, All Color Cast. Was that created in 83? I think that was created in 84. So. I don't know, man. But that's 109 right there. On there. I think that is wild. Oman, dude, that is something, something else. And I'm looking at pictures. I pulled up um, Instagram, and I'm I'm looking at one of my former colleagues, Nicole Brewer, who lives in Oman. I'm looking at pictures from Oman right now. It's a small world. I made a video for um YouTube, and I was trying to talk about trying to talk about it. I was, and I I concluded that it's a small world, but I was trying to sing "It's a Small World" and the melody was off. So let me let me get it right this time. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's. I guess that's all I remember because I. It's a small world after. I don't know what what goes on. Yeah, I don't know what comes after that. Yeah, but it's a small world after all because it's like this is just just wild what's happening i'm looking at pictures of of oman look at that beautiful magical country man i used to live there really really nice stuff oman those mountains oh my gosh man that is such a oh what a what a place what a country, what a land. Oh my gosh, dude, it's just, yep, I've been to Bahla, Bahla Fort, yep. Look out, some images from there. They are really good images, my goodness. All right, that's the end of my podcast. That's it. I just wanted to tell you that I opened the book tonight and I found that um, that there was a list of 111 things. And the 109th thing was Oman. Not really things, but 109 trade routes. And it said Oman on there. It's in the book. So if you get the book, let me see. Let me grab. No, it's not on a page 109. No. It's on another page. I'm looking for it now. I should have put the, the book mark on that page but I was just like yeah I found it and that was about it Cordoba hmm. or did I did I put it on the bookmark in there no it doesn't look like I didn't do that no and I can't find it where is it did I imagine all of this it's not in the book I see the loot the loot was there Give me the loot. Give me the loot. All right, I'm I'm about to I'm about to come up on it. Here we go. Here we go. I'm almost there. Yeah, this is a dynamic book. Here we go. Here we go. There it is. It's on page 222. On page 222, there's a list of 111. You know, it says 
major, major trading and commercial centers. And then the list begins in the Iberian Peninsula in Europe. Then it goes into Africa. And then it says Eastern Mediterranean. And then finally it goes to the Arabian Peninsula. And there you have it. Let's see. I've been to Jeddah. Jeddah. Wow, that's interesting. So all the places that I've been to in Saudi Arabia only have... Like, the places that they mentioned, mostly they're on the uh, western seaboard, if you want to call it that. I lived on the eastern seaboard. Um, so, they don't really mention any places on the east, as many places on the east. So, and I've only been to, in Saudi Arabia, only been to Jeddah. I've been to Riyadh, but Riyadh isn't, an, isn't a trading port. Riyadh's in the middle of the country, far from the, the coast, so. All right, then we got, um, yeah, I've only been to Jeddah. And then um, Oman and Muscat are mentioned. Oman is 109, and then Muscat, the capital of Oman, is 110. And then the other numbers, whatever. But 109 was, is Oman. 109 is Oman. That's like the book knew that 109 was going to be important to me and I took this book because I knew the book was going to be important to me but the but the book knew before I knew that 109 was going to be important to me that's what that says to me Man, I'm sorry it took so long for me to just say that little thing I could have started the podcast off by saying that and you would have been finished in two, 20 seconds all I had to do was say Hey, this is uh, Larry Wiggs for the IC10.9 podcast, and I want to tell you that um, strange things happened to me when I was in Oman related to the number 109. I wrote my book entitled 109, and uh, I saw a license plate with 109 on it, and it was a very peculiar way of seeing it. That same car that had the 109 on the license plate had cut me off. And it wasn't like I was looking for 109, but it, it just presented itself in front of me and demanded my attention on that morning that the car cut me off. And there weren't hundreds of cars on the road. It was just me and this other car, this one other car. So it was, it was, it was, like, it was like destiny to see 109 there that happened to me. And then tonight I opened up a book about Arabian civilizations. I turned to a page and I looked at a list of trade centers the centers where uh trade took place around the world and then listed on that was oman now the list was of 111 trade centers and oman is listed on that list as number 109 i could have just said it like that and maybe that would have been more effective for maximum you know, impact or whatever. I don't know. Peace and blessings. IC 10-9. I'm out. You're at 109 right now.